Before we get too far into this, I need to warn you. I am going to say positive and negative things about both Medicare Advantage plans and Medicare Supplement plans. I'm going to present the facts around these plans with the data available to us today, and I'm going to claim that this is as unbiased and unexaggerated a video that you will see on this topic, because frankly, I don't care which one you choose. I only care that you have the plan that you are comfortable with and that you feel will protect your health and finances. Now, there are a lot of variables, so I'm going to outline my assumptions for this comparison right now. If you don't care about how I chose to compare what I chose to compare and want to jump straight into the juicy details, there are chapters below and you can skip to the chapter titled, Let's Get Ready to Rumble. Just so you know, if you do skip this part and then leave a comment that is directly addressed in the assumptions, well, I don't know what to tell you. We're going to be looking at the six major categories that most individuals use when they are making health insurance plan decisions. I'll dive into each topic and then crown a winner of each category. At the end, we'll add up which plan has the most crowns, and then half of you will be angry with me and half of you will say, I knew it. We'll be looking at the most common plans across the country and the most common choices we see people make when they have all of the choices in front of them. That means a $0 premium Medicare Advantage plan going up against a Medicare Supplement Plan G. Why not a Plan F or a High Deductible Plan G or a Plan N? We love all of these options for the right person, but for several reasons, as of now, Plan G is still the most popular, and this video is going to be running into the 20 plus minute mark, so for time, we're just looking at Plan G today. In an effort to compare as close to fair as we can, we include the assumption that a standalone Part D prescription drug plan, dental, and vision plans would be added to the supplement plan equation. You do not have to get any of these, although most choose to at least get a Part D plan. From a dollar's perspective, things are highly dependent on where you live. There are parts of the country where a Plan G for a 65-year-old is $100 per month. There are other parts of the country where they are over $300 per month for the same 65-year-old. We're going to go with what we have available in our surrounding states, so know that figures could be higher or lower depending on where you live. All right, let's get ready to rumble. Hello to those who skipped the assumptions. I've already touched on the first category, and that is premiums. Premiums are the fixed dollar amount that you have to pay every single month just to have these plans. You pay premiums even if you never have to go to a doctor or hospital and you never have anything go wrong. As we mentioned earlier, most Advantage plans are $0 premiums. If they aren't $0 premiums in your area, they are most likely less than $50 per month. An important thing to remember with premiums is that with either option, an Advantage plan or a supplement plan, you still have your Medicare Part B premiums to pay, which in 2024 start at $174.70 per person per month. Part B premiums are income-based, meaning they go up for those with higher incomes. So just because I say a $0 premium Advantage plan, that does not mean that you get to avoid the Part B premium. You still have to pay that with both Advantage and Supplement plans. Now, there are Advantage plans that have a Part B give back of sorts where they will send some money back to offset that Part B premium, but these are the exception, not the norm. Please, if you see marketing around these give back plans, you must understand that number one, these are not available everywhere, and number two, there is usually a trade off in benefits for this, meaning a higher out of pocket max or a difference in copays or fewer other benefits that we'll get to here in a minute in exchange for this buyback. Okay, when it comes to supplement plans, premiums are the Achilles heel. Medicare supplement plans have premiums and they are usually age based. The technical term is attained age plans. This means that Every year, your supplement plan premium is based on the age that you have attained, and it will increase in cost as you attain a new age on your birthday. A 68-year-old will pay a little bit more than a 67-year-old, who will pay a little bit more than a 66-year-old. In addition to the annual age bump, insurance companies typically do a rate bump across the board to account for inflation and rising healthcare costs. So it is not uncommon to see two premium increases each year with a supplement plan. Some years you may see little to no increase followed by another year with a bigger increase, but the bottom line is your supplement plan premiums do increase over time. There are supplement plans that are called issue age plans as well as community rated plans. They are not as common, but they do exist. They do not increase based on your birthday. However, these plans typically start a little bit higher and they still have increases based on inflation and rising healthcare costs. We hear from people all over the country who are in their 70s and 80s who get priced out of Plan G because of those premium increases. And they're paying upwards of three to four to $500 per month for their supplement Plan G. For those on fixed income or worried about retirement budgets, that's a lot to deal with. In our area for a Plan G, the average premium for a 65 year old is around $150 per person per month or about $1,800 per year. 
For each year above 65, it goes up a little bit. Remember, this is highly dependent on number one, where you live, and number two, what company you pick. Another negative when it comes to supplement plan premiums is that you cannot use your HSA dollars to pay for supplement plan premiums without a penalty. So if you're thinking, hey, no big deal, I have this huge HSA saved up to cover all of those costs. Well, you can't use those dollars for supplement plan premiums. You can still use your HSA to cover the deductible, just not the premiums. The last negative around supplement plan premiums would be that supplement plans do not cover prescription drugs, dental, or vision. If you want those, they have their own premiums, which I will cover in about 18 seconds. So there really isn't a debate here when it comes to premium costs. Even the biggest haters of Advantage plans and lovers of supplement plans can't really argue this one. This goes to Advantage plans because it isn't close. But don't stop watching here. There are reasons for this, which you will see. All right, let's talk about other coverage options included in the plans. Most people going on to Medicare like to have similar coverage to what they had while they were working. So things like drug coverage, dental, and vision become important discussion items. Well, Advantage plans often come with prescription drug coverage, various levels of dental and vision coverage, and hearing aid coverage included in that $0 or low premium. You do not have to pay more to have these coverages. Supplement plans do not come with any of these things. You can get these different drug, dental, and vision plans separately, but you have to pay additional premiums for them on top of the already higher supplement plan premiums. The average Part D premium in 2024 is $55.50 per person per month, or another roughly $670 per year. You can find plans lower than this. There are also plans higher than this. A typical dental plan premium is about $40 per month or $480 per year. A vision plan is around $15 per month or $180 per year. So you're looking at much higher monthly premiums with the supplement plan route, with each of these plan premiums typically increasing a little bit each year as well. The Advantage plan also takes this category quite easily. Okay, the third category would be other perks thrown into the plans. Some of you may be coming off rich employer plans that offered other perks that were thrown in there. Things like gym memberships, transportation to and from doctor visits, meals after visiting a hospital, a quarterly allowance for over-the-counter supplies, and other benefits exist in the Medicare world. Many Advantage plans come with these types of things included in that $0 premium. Supplement plans, do not. Supplement plans are specialists. They are designed to fill in the gaps of original Medicare only, and that's it. They do this very well, but that is their role. Now, there are some supplement plans that have a gym membership, but they are the exception, and the supplement plans in general just don't come with the bells and whistles that typically come with Advantage plans. Advantage plans take this category as well, and so far, Advantage plans have a considerable lead in this fight, but this is a six round fight and we have three more to go. Just like your favorite Rocky movie, supplement plans are down but not out and things are about to change. Let's talk about cost sharing. Cost sharing would be the dollars that you need to pay out of your pocket when you actually use the healthcare system. These only happen if you go to a doctor or a facility needing care and you would see cost sharing in the form of a deductible or copay and or coinsurance. Really fast, a deductible is the dollar amount that you must pay first before insurance starts to help. A copay is a set dollar amount for a service. Insurance pays part of it, and then your part is a set amount, like $50 or $150 or whatever the copay is. Coinsurance is a percentage. Insurance pays, say, 80% of the total bill, and then you pay 20% of the total bill. It's not fixed, it's not as predictable, because it is a percentage of the overall bill. Okay, with those $0 premium Advantage plans, you will have copays or coinsurance for most healthcare services. You go see a specialist, copay. You get an MRI, copay. You get an x-ray, copay. You have a surgery, copay or coinsurance. You pay these copays and coinsurance amounts until you reach your plan's maximum out-of-pocket. These maximum out-of-pocket amounts vary dramatically across the country. In our area, the average out-of-pocket max in 2024 is right around $5,200. In other areas of the country, they are as low as $500 or as high as $8,850. That is for in-network services. If you go out of network, that's a different story, and I'll talk about networks in the next section. It is important to understand here that a deductible and a maximum out-of-pocket are not the same. A lot of people see that maximum out-of-pocket number, and they think that they need to be ready to pay that immediately because they are used to a high deductible health plan through work or the marketplace. That is not the case with Advantage plans. Most do not have a deductible. Some do, but most don't. So you do not have to pay that large dollar amount first before the plan helps. Your Advantage plan starts covering approved procedures immediately. 
you get to the maximum amount of pocket through co-pays and co-insurance. The whole point of me mentioning this is that the cost sharing potential here, which you will see, is potentially more than a supplement plan. But getting to that maximum out of pocket is much harder on an Advantage plan than on a high deductible health plan through work. There are high cost procedures and disease states that will get you to that out of pocket max, but going in for an emergency appendectomy isn't going to land you with a several thousand dollar bill that you need to pay like it would with a high deductible health plan. You'll see a couple hundred dollar copay for the surgery. If you get a knee surgery, you'll see a couple hundred dollar outpatient copay for that. Okay, with a supplement plan, specifically Plan G, for any Medicare approved expenses, all you have to pay is the Part B deductible, which is $240 in 2024. After you've met that $240 deductible, your Plan G and Original Medicare will take care of 100% of the costs for all Medicare approved Part A and Part B procedures done by a participating provider. This is unbelievable coverage. That emergency appendectomy, likely $240 to meet your Part B deductible. Then the rest is taken care of. You have a knee surgery a week later, it's quite the week, nothing. You've already met your Part B deductible. If you have 100 Medicare approved surgeries that year, Original Medicare and Supplement Plan G take care of the rest. And if you have multiple bad years, year over year, supplement plans can be a no-brainer. So when it comes to your cost sharing, strictly from a dollars and cents perspective, if you have high healthcare costs, meaning costs that will be higher than the difference in the premiums for the supplement plan, plus the Part B deductible, and then the Advantage plan out of pocket maximum, supplement plans win this one. And in terms of the ease of mental processing power required to understand the cost sharing, supplement plans win this easily. Now the next two categories have financial components tied to them, but they are much more focused on peace of mind and the freedom to make certain healthcare decisions. So let's talk about networks. Advantage plans typically come in two network varieties. There are more than two, but the two most common are an HMO, which stands for Health Maintenance Organization, and a PPO, which stands for Preferred Provider Organization. In general, with an HMO, you need to visit doctors and facilities that are in the insurance company's network to get coverage. If you don't, and you go out of network, you could be responsible for 100% of the costs. There are no absolutes here, so there are exceptions to this, but in general, HMO networks are tighter and more confined to smaller geographic areas. Needing a referral to see a specialist is common in these plans, but there are plans that do not require a referral. So if you hear of someone saying, hey, my Advantage plan denied a covered blood test, that likely means they are in an HMO Advantage plan and they had that test done out of network. In general, with a PPO plan, you'll also have a network of doctors and facilities, but with a PPO, it is typically a larger network. Another difference between PPO and HMO plans is that the PPO plans come with some form of out of network coverage, meaning if you do visit an out of network doctor, you will pay more than you would have for an in network visit, but you won't be responsible for 100% of the cost like you could in a traditional HMO plan. Out-of-pocket maximums are typically lower with an HMO plan and a little bit higher on a PPO plan. Your maximum out-of-pocket number is also higher if you go out of network. So instead of that $5,200 out-of-pocket max average that we see and that we mentioned earlier, in our area, we see between almost $9,000 and up to $13,000 as an out-of-pocket, out-of-network maximum. Okay, another super important part of this network conversation with Advantage plans, because we hear this all the time, goes something like, Never get an Advantage plan because if you are on vacation and an emergency happens, you are gonna pay for everything. That is not true. If you have an emergency outside of your plan's coverage area and you visit an out-of-network facility or provider, all Advantage plans are required to cover this as in-network. Now, it must truly be an emergency. So if you scrape your knee or you have a sore throat and you go to the ER out-of-network, that won't be counted as a true emergency. So when it is an emergency and coded as such, which comes from the hospital, you are covered as if you were in network. However, there can be maximums on this coverage as well, so be careful. If you travel a lot and you have medical conditions that put you in the hospital often, or you live in multiple locations and have routine visits, Advantage plans are zip code or county specific. So if you live in New York for part of the year and Florida for another part of the year, and you want an Advantage plan, you'll likely want to switch as you move, which you can do, because your New York Advantage plan probably isn't going to have your Florida doctors in network and vice versa. 
So switch to the Florida Advantage plan when you're there, switch back to the New York Advantage plan when you go back. Another part of the Advantage plan network conversation that is important to understand is that if you are looking for an Advantage plan and working with an agent, you aren't just picking a random plan willy-nilly and crossing your fingers hoping that your favorite doctors are covered. You can search for in-network providers before you get your plan. In fact, with all of our clients and with any reputable agent we've ever dealt with, we will all get a list of your providers and your preferred hospitals, and we will do the search to make sure that the doctors that you want are in-network. Now, fair warning, some providers are not a part of any Advantage plan networks, and you may need to find a new doctor. Certain facilities do not take Advantage plans. Mayo Clinic warns that it is not in network with most Advantage plans. And the last point about Advantage plan networks is that the providers can drop from the networks mid-year. What this means is that you may search for a provider or have one that you really like, and when you initially go on your Advantage plan, all is well. But a few months or a few years later, your provider can decide not to participate with that insurance company's network anymore and drop from that network in the middle of the year. The point is, with Advantage plans, networks are real, and they are an important part of your care to understand and to get right. Just like most of us have had our entire lives with employer plans, we have networks that we need to keep track of. All right, supplement plans do not have a network. How nice is that? Much more simple too, well, sort of. With Original Medicare and a supplement plan, you can visit any provider or facility that participates with Medicare anywhere in the country, and Medicare together with your supplement plan will cover it according to Medicare rules. That word participate is important. Another way to say this is they accept Medicare assignment. Here's why that matters. Those who feel that supplement plans are the only way people should go usually say, get them because you can see any doctor you want, whenever you want, for whatever reason that you want, and you can't do that on an Advantage plan, followed by taunting in some form. That's not entirely true. With a supplement plan, any provider or facility that participates with Medicare will accept your supplement plan anywhere in the country. That's not 100% of all providers and facilities across the country. It is 97% of all non-pediatric providers, and since we're talking about a supplement plan G that covers excess charges for the instances of providers who do not participate with Medicare, that number bumps up to 99% of all non-pediatric providers, leaving 1% of non-pediatric providers nationwide who have opted out of Medicare completely and will not take Medicare, nor will they take a supplement plan. So it's not 100% of all providers, but 99% is a very impressive number. This gives people a lot of peace of mind because they don't really have to worry much around whether or not they can see a doctor. However, you'll still wanna make sure that your facilities and your providers participate with Medicare. The clear winner here is the supplement plan. The peace of mind and freedom knowing that you have access to 99% of providers across the country, it is awesome. All right, the last category I'm going to call administration, and that word is one that typically causes most people to tune out and fall asleep, but this could be the most important section of this video for you. It also happens to be the most controversial category that will spark a lot of opinion on both sides, and it is the most detailed section of this video. Think of this category as how easy is it to use the plan when you need it? This is a tremendously touchy topic, so entertain me as I try to balance both sides with real data. With an Advantage plan, all benefits are managed and administered by the insurance company. Original Medicare is no longer involved as the payer. The insurance company offering the Advantage plan replaces Original Medicare, and it takes on all of the financial risk away from Original Medicare for Part A and Part B services. Plus, the Advantage plan takes on the risk of those other benefits like medications, dental, vision, and the others that we mentioned. In exchange, the government agrees to pay the insurance company an amount each month for every person that the insurance company covers. These dollar amounts depend on a lot of things like geography, health of the individual, quality ratings of the insurance company, and more. So I don't have the exact numbers for you around how much the insurance companies get for this, but for simple, even numbers, let's say that it's $1,000 per month. Actually, in 2019, the average was just under this, but we're four years out from that, so the number is likely a little bit higher. I don't know what's fair. Let's say that it's $1,300 per month now. The exact dollar amount doesn't matter for this point. What matters is that an Advantage plan is a managed care plan. The insurance company has a say over your healthcare decisions. The company is trying to limit or eliminate overspending that comes from unnecessary healthcare procedures and services. 
Advantage plans agree to and must cover everything that original Medicare covers. However, they do not do it in the same way. This means that with many Advantage plans, especially the HMO plans we discussed, you may need a referral to see a specialist, as an example. You may have an MRI denied because the insurance company wants to see a different, less expensive test run first. You may have to get a prior authorization before getting the care that you or your provider think you need. An insurance company is managing the care in hopes of limiting unnecessary costs so that the insurance company can reduce waste, stay in business, and yes, everybody's favorite word to hate, stay profitable. Their hope is that on the entire group of people they cover, the average cost is less than that $1,300 per person per month number that we used, or less than $15,600 per year in this example. One mistake people make is that they see that an insurance company is profitable or wildly profitable, and they assume that that means that they will never lose any money on any individual, meaning they will never pay more than $15,600 per year for a person in this fictitious example of dollars. This is not correct. Insurance companies lose a lot of money on individuals, but the overall collective of people that they insure typically does not lose money because there are more people every year who cost far less than that dollar amount allocated per year. Every insurance company out there has heartfelt slogans and initiatives around helping patients and providers make more wise decisions and there is some truth in that, but to say that profit is not a motivating factor would be incorrect for both Advantage plans and supplement plan insurance companies. Now, stay with me here. The New York Times released an article in 2002 talking about Advantage plan denials of care. The article got a lot of popularity, and you guessed it, it caused a lot of anger, and there were a lot of problems with the conclusions that the article drew from the methods of this study referenced if you really want to dive into it, but let's talk about it at face value. The conclusions were that 13% of claims denied by Advantage plans in the set of data that they looked at should have been approved. Denying claims for medically necessary care is absolutely unacceptable. Now let's look at the other side of that number. 87% of claims that were denied in this sample should have been denied according to independent reviewers who were looking for reasons to overturn them. So the reality of the healthcare system here is that there are facilities and providers that exist who will bill or attempt services that are not medically necessary, they submit for services that would not be approved by an Advantage plan. Denials on original Medicare and supplement plans happen too, by the way. And if you are a provider watching this, this does not mean that you are doing something inherently wrong either. The billing and coding of these procedures is remarkably complicated, and if the code isn't sent in correctly, it can be denied. If the reasoning for the procedure isn't articulated correctly, it can be denied. But to have an honest dialogue about this, we have to talk about a real problem in the healthcare system. Estimates of between 60 and $100 billion per per year are lost due to Medicare fraud. Part of that is fraudulent billing by providers and facilities, billing for procedures that didn't happen, billing for higher cost procedures when lower cost, equally effective options weren't tried first. I'm not a physician, so it's not for me to say whether a provider and patient should or shouldn't do something, but we can't ignore the fact that fraud does happen. And guess what? It happens with Advantage plans too. So now you have the good providers and the facilities that are having to jump through hoops caused by the much, much smaller number of fraudulent providers and facilities. And whether we like it or not, Advantage plans that are run correctly play a role in ensuring unnecessary procedures are not used when less costly options have not been attempted first. Now let's flip back over to the other side. There are insurance companies that are much more liberal with denials. Each insurance company has its own criteria for claim approvals, and when an insurance company is denying claims, stating that medical necessity isn't seen when it really is, that is a serious problem. Know that with all Advantage plans, you do have the option to appeal a denial. Similar to the providers, just because an insurance company does something blatantly wrong does not mean that they all do, and legislation is getting more and more controlled around the abusers of the system on both sides. So how rampant are prior authorization denials as an example? Well, let's look at the data that's available. In a study of all available prior authorization requests in 2021, which is the most recent study that we could find of this magnitude, 6% were denied. Of those denials that were appealed, 82% were overturned, either completely or partially. A more narrow study in 2022 put the inpatient level of care claim denial at 5.8%, so very close to that 6% number. For context, the denial rate for the same claims across all payer categories, meaning not Advantage plans, other than Advantage plans, is 3.7%. Is there a difference? Yes. Is it anywhere near the scary idea of every procedure that you will ever need will just be denied? No.
One last area to cover here would be things like skilled nursing facilities. With an Advantage plan, remember you have networks, so you're likely looking at a smaller network of facilities that you would have access to, as well as the number of days approved. Care managers review your condition for significant improvement. Those are the words that they use. Skilled nursing facilities are for rehab. You go in, you get better, you go home. And that's for original Medicare and a supplement plan too, by the way. But an Advantage plan is much more proactive in monitoring that getting better part and some people feel like they were pushed out of a skilled nursing facility before they felt ready based on the care management criteria used. So if you get an Advantage plan, are they great until you need them? Will you be denied for anything and everything that you hope to get? Will all major surgeries and procedures go unpaid and fall on you? No, not even close. On the other hand, are there horror stories out there? Is there a risk that a procedure you and your doctor want to do will be denied or require a prior authorization? Yes. As I stated in the beginning of this video, I will say positive and negative things about both plans, and unfortunately, people take me saying anything positive about Advantage plans to mean that it's all I would recommend and that they are my favorite. This is not the case. They are nowhere near all I recommend, and they are not my favorite. Wait 32 more seconds, and you'll hear how I talk about supplement plans. So the bottom line with Advantage plan administration is that an insurance company has a say in your healthcare decisions, and it gets complicated. Want a super small in the grand scheme of things positive about Advantage plan administration? Just to bring us out of that deep, heavy conversation that we just had, the good news with an Advantage plan administration is that it's all under one roof with one ID card that you practically use everywhere. One login and password for your online portals. You aren't carrying around your Medicare card, your supplement plan card, your dental card, your vision card, your prescription drug card, or any other cards that you have. Just the one, much easier in that sense. Okay, let's talk about supplement plans because they are a different story. Because supplement plans pay secondary to Medicare. If original Medicare covers it, the supplement plan covers it. No questions asked. How boring is that? And in this case, boring is not a bad thing. Now again, the exaggerations often come in here that with a supplement plan, you will never have pre-authorizations or denials. You and your doctor can do anything and everything you've ever dreamed of, no matter what, and it is covered. That isn't true. Medicare does not cover everything. And if Medicare does not cover something, your supplement plan will not cover it either. You can't just go and do whatever you want whenever you want. Medicare is there to cover medically necessary procedures, not experimental procedures, not elective plastic surgeries, not anything and everything. However, you don't have the same management of your care and pre-authorizations for Medicare covered procedures that you could see with an Advantage plan. In most cases, providers and facilities prefer working with original Medicare and a supplement plan for this reason. It is much more simple, it is boring, it isn't micromanaging all of their decisions. So after all of that, the winner of the administration category is the supplement plan, and it really isn't close. Okay, we have arrived at our final results and we have a tie. It is three to three and this is intentional. It is inaccurate and entirely misleading for anyone to say that everyone should get an Advantage plan or that everyone should get a supplement plan. So who do we typically see lean towards each of these? In general, an Advantage plan works for people who put more weight in the lower monthly premiums, either because they cannot afford hundreds of dollars a month going to the supplement plan route, or they are healthy and they just hate the idea of paying for something that they don't use. People who are okay using in-network providers like they have their whole life and both understand and are comfortable with how managed care works typically do well with Advantage plans. They live in areas with strong plans that have their providers and hospitals in network. People who have a higher risk tolerance and they feel like they will have more good years where they are saving money on premiums than they will have bad years where they will have to pay more in co-pays and co-insurance lean towards Advantage plans. Remember, nationally, only about 3 to 5% of Medicare beneficiaries hit their out-of-pocket max each year. So the risk is there, but the risk is low. Surprisingly, we see a decent amount of very wealthy individuals that can afford the higher premiums of the supplement plans, but they take the Advantage plan to save on monthly premiums, and if something bad happens, they have enough to cover it. People who have the funds to handle a bad year or multiple bad years, especially those with large HSA balances, enjoy the premium savings with Advantage plans. In short, people who feel like the first three categories of this video are more important to them than the last three categories of this video, they favor Advantage plans. Now, in general, Medicare supplement plans work well for people who are high utilizers of the healthcare system. If you have a chronic illness, diabetes, cancer, you need a lot of surgeries and a lot of hospital visits, a supplement plan is something that you should strongly consider. People who value the freedom to go to more providers anywhere in the country, including the Mayo Clinic, 
gravitate to supplement plans. Maybe they have multiple homes or they travel a lot. Supplement plans give them a different sort of freedom. People who do not like the idea of managed care like supplement plans. People who have low risk tolerances, meaning that they are uncomfortable with the risk of a bad year or bad years, and they would prefer to pay more now to not have to worry later if something does go wrong, prefer supplement plans. And they can afford the ever-increasing premiums of supplement plans. In short, people who weigh the last three categories higher than the first three categories in this video favor supplement plans. Advantage plans are also not available everywhere, especially in more rural parts of the country. So people who live in areas that do not have access to Advantage plans don't have a choice, and they would either go with Original Medicare only or Original Medicare and the supplement plan route. For those on Medicaid, meaning those with low incomes, agents and companies are not allowed to offer you supplement plans. So these are not an option for those on Medicaid. You can again either stick with Medicaid and Original Medicare, or there are plans that are specifically designed that are Advantage plans for those who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Switching from an Advantage plan to a supplement plan can get tricky depending on where you live and when you got your plan. We have a video up here that goes over the whole switching situation. And here's the last thing about these two plans that needs to be addressed. You need to know about agent commissions. In general, Advantage plans tend to offer higher first year commissions to agents than supplement plans. So that first year that somebody goes on Medicare and picks between one of these two options. Commissions are paid to agents for both Advantage plans and supplement plans, as well as prescription drug plans, dental, and vision plans. So in full transparency, in many areas and with many plans, agents can make more in first year commissions with Advantage plans over Supplement Plan G. This is where I get a little bit fired up and I talk about it in other videos extensively. If an agent is pushing you on any plan that is a poor fit for you, that agent will not be in business long. In the long run, we are much more stable, doing the right thing and keeping our clients with us, not chasing higher commissions and losing upset clients each year. But for you, when you are making a decision and working with somebody, pay attention to whether they are educating and serving you or ignoring you and pushing you to one particular plan with one company. To break through the noise of everything out there, marketers, companies, agents need to throw extreme titles and content designed to make you angry or to make you feel cheated because it is proven to get more views and to get more clicks and to get more phone calls. So watch out for the absolutes of always and never and the over the top warnings. Titles that say you did the right thing. The world isn't as bad as it seems. They don't get the same attention. All right, if you made it this far, I feel like you should prove it by leaving a secret comment in this video. I love animals. In fact, here is my wise elephant and my powerful rhino. If you can sneak in an animal into your comment somehow, then I'll know that you've watched the full video and I feel like I can take your comment a little bit more seriously because you watched everything, weighed the information, and then you left your thoughts. If I don't see something about an animal, I just have to assume that that person didn't watch this whole thing and they are probably saying something that I covered later that they just didn't have the time to make it to. You should not make your Medicare decisions based on a YouTube video, including this one. So please work with an agent. If you have that person in your life, please use them. It's what they have dedicated their life to in order to help you. If you do not have that person in your life, we are happy to help. We have partners who are licensed for all 50 states. So if you're looking for help, we have someone who can guide you through this maze. This is where I'm supposed to ask you to subscribe to our channel because we put out videos weekly about all things Medicare and Social Security. If you're feeling super generous, throw in a like and a comment about what plan looks the best to you. Thank you for taking the time to invest in your Medicare knowledge. As always, I appreciate you and I will see you in the next video.